Hated by their contemporaries, they earned nicknames like Accursed, Hater of Sunlight, and simply Monster during the Middle Ages. In this video, we discuss three individuals who acted with violence, treachery, and downright nastiness just because they could. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Brotherly Love Sviadipuk was born around 980. His mother was a Greek nun who was brought from Bulgaria and married to Yaropolk, Prince of Rus. Kievan Rus was a state in northeastern Europe that lasted from the late 9th until the mid 13th century. In 980, Yaropolk was murdered by his brother Vladimir, and he immediately forced his brother's wife into marriage. Soon after, Sviadipuk was born. Vladimir fathered numerous children with his six wives and converted to Christianity in 988. When he was eight years old, Vladimir put Sviadipuk in charge of the Principality of Turov, and later arranged for him to be married to the daughter of Boleslaw, King of Poland. She arrived in Turov with Reinburn, the Bishop of Kolberg. Frustrated with his father, egged on by his wife and the bishop, Sviadipuk began to prepare for war against his father Vladimir with the support of his father-in-law, Boleslaw the Brave. But Vladimir discovered the plot and threw all three of the schemers in prison where Reinburn died. Blood Brothers Sviadipok was released from prison and sent to govern a town several miles away from Kiev. Vladimir's death in 1015 was concealed from his eldest son, as it was thought that he would try and claim the Kievan throne for himself. However, Sviadipok was soon informed and he rushed to Kiev where he immediately seized power. Needing to quickly get rid of any political opponents, Sviadipok made a cold-blooded decision, one that would earn him the nickname of the Accursed. He went after his brother Boris first. Boris had been in charge of their father's army and personal guards, so he presented the most danger. Boris and his manservant were stabbed to death while sleeping by Sviadipok's mercenaries. Whilst his body was being transported back to Kiev in a bag, Boris was thought to be still breathing, so he was run through with a sword. Next, Sviadipok sent for his brother Gleb on the pretext that their father was on his deathbed and needed to see him. On his way home, Gleb was told of the deaths and the treachery of Sviadipok. As Gleb was praying for the souls of both his father and brother, he was assassinated by his own cook, who, hired by Sviadipok, slit his throat with a kitchen knife. A third brother named Sviadislav, on learning of the deaths of Boris and Gleb, tried to flee to the Carpathian Mountains with his family, but he was hunted down. In the ensuing fight, he was killed along with seven of his sons. His daughter ran up the mountain, pursued by Sviadipok's soldiers, but threw herself off before they could reach her. Oh brother. With so much blood on his hands, Sviadipok decided that his best chance of success was to unite the lands inherited from his father under one ruler, namely himself, the Grand Prince of Kiev. But another one of his supposedly endless brothers called Yaroslav, then Prince of Novgorod, learned of the triple murder and sought revenge. The two brothers fought one another over two years, each one winning and losing battles until 1019 Sviadipok either died or was murdered whilst fleeing to Poland after his defeat at the Battle of the Alta River. His brother Yaroslav the Wise and Grand Prince of Kiev ruled for the next 35 years and was voted the greatest Ukrainian in 2008. Mabel the Monster Mabel of Belém was born in Alicon, France around 1036. Her parents belonged to the influential Talvas family. Her father, William I Talvas, was well known for his exceptional cruelty. He had his first wife, Hildeberg, strangled on the way to church. She was the mother of his two children and a pious woman who loved God and refused to support his wicked ways. At his second wedding, he had one of the guests, William Fitzgerald, mutilated and blinded because he felt like it. Mabel's brother, Arnulf, had had enough of his father's wickedness, and when he exiled the man, Mabel chose to stand by her father and she accompanied him into Normandy. There they were taken in by the powerful de Montgomery family. Talvas promised their son Roger II that if he married Mabel, he would inherit all of the Talvas lands once they had taken them back from Arnulf. So Mabel and Roger were married around 1054. 
When Arnulf died the following year, the couple's fortunes were increased considerably. Blind Ambition Mabel and Roger's mutual desire for power made for a successful marriage. Roger was a favourite of William Duke of Normandy, who later became known as King William I of England. But unlike Roger, Mabel hated the church. Unable to openly attack the clergy, Mabel would visit nearby monasteries with a huge retinue of knights, ladies and servants. The monks who were obliged to feed their visitors were soon forced into poverty because of the costs. Now turning back to her hatred of the Gerol family, when Arnold de Eschenfort, who was son to the mutilated William de Gerol, asked for a truce. When Arnold, who had presented Roger with a fine cloak as a peace offering, was promised free passage over Montgomery land in 1063, a raging Mabel plotted to kill him. She chose poison as her murder weapon, and told her prettiest ladies to tempt Arnold to take some wine before his journey home. Arnold, sensing danger, refused the drink, which was unfortunately quickly grabbed by Roger's only brother Gilbert and gulped down. Gilbert died after spending three days in agony. Undaunted, Mabel made friends with Arnold's Chamberlain, and after she convinced him to arrange for a special drink for Arnold, he died in 1064, and his lands reverted to the Montgomerys. Roger and Mabel were able to gain many more lands by whispering false tales of rebellion into the ear of the paranoid Duke of Normandy. Every time Roger spoke of nobles plotting dissent, their lands were seized and given to the couple. Although Roger did not take part in the Norman conquest of England, he provided 60 ships for the invasion and stayed in Normandy as co-regent with Matilda of Flanders, the Duke's wife. He was rewarded with the Earldom of Shrewsbury and several estates, making him one of the biggest landowners at the time. In 1079, Hugh Brunel, who had lost all of his money and estates because of Mabel's scheming, forced his way into her chateau. Mabel was relaxing in the bath when she was decapitated. Brunel managed to escape. Like mother, like son. Mabel was described as ready enough to do evil and cruel, and it would seem that her son, Robert III Earl of Shrewsbury, carried on the family tradition. He was described as grasping and cruel, and a persecutor of the church and the poor. It's not hard to imagine that Mabel would have been very proud of her evil son. A Greek Tragedy Andronicus I Komnenos was the grandson of the Byzantine Emperor Alexios I, and was born about 1118 when his uncle was Emperor John II. Andronicus was lauded for being, quote, handsome, eloquent, active, hardy, and courageous. He spent his early years in military service when he wasn't having a good time, because he was also known for being a bit of a womanizer. In 1141, Andronicus was captured by Seljuk Turkomans whilst out hunting game. By this time, his cousin Manuel I had become emperor. Because Manuel refused to pay Andronicus' ransom, he remained a prisoner with the Turks for at least a year, which caused some resentment. On his eventual ransom and return to Constantinople, Andronikos resided at the court of Manuel, where he became one of his cousin's favourites. It was whilst here that he became infatuated with his cousin Eudocia, and even though he was already married, she became his mistress. This incestuous relationship caused a great deal of scandal at court, Eudocia's brothers were particularly angered by the union. Fighter so Manuel sent Andronikos 500 miles away to the provenance of Cilicia, and Eudocia accompanied him there. Although Andronikos distinguished himself in battle against the Armenians, the campaign was a failure and he was called back to Constantinople. Given the title of Governor of Belgrade, he was sent away once more, this time to fight on the Hungarian border, but Andronikos was summoned back home again when it was discovered that he was involved in a plot to overthrow his cousin, the Emperor. Once back in Constantinople, he narrowly escaped assassination by Eudocia's family by making an impressive escape and slashing his way out of her tent in a sword fight. Despite his disloyalty, the Emperor still thought so highly of Andronicus that no punishment was ever given for his wrongdoings, and Andronicus rewarded Manuel once again by plotting to oust his cousin. Unable to ignore this second attempt on his throne, Manuel had Andronicus imprisoned in 1155 for conspiracy and incest. Andronikos escaped twice, but was recaptured. 
His third attempt was more successful and he was able to make his way to the Black Sea, where he was received by the Russian Prince Yaroslav in Kiev, who made him advisor. Andronikos was able to arrange an alliance between Manuel and Yaroslav and restored himself in the Emperor's favour. Lover He went on to help Manuel invade Hungary, but was enraged when Manuel married the Hungarian prince to his daughter and named him his successor. So Andronikos, who was now in his 50s, was sent away to Cilicia again. However, he abandoned his post and decided to go to Syria to seduce Manuel's sister-in-law, Philippa, which he did quite successfully despite her being half his age. After a few weeks, now bored with Philippa and obviously wanting to wind up the Emperor some more, Andronikos moved on to Theodora in Jerusalem. She was only 22 and Manuel's niece. The Emperor had finally had enough and gave orders for Andronikos to be arrested and blinded as a punishment but he evaded capture by moving around Asia. In 1180, Manuel died, leaving his 11-year-old son, Alexios II, as emperor and his wife, Maria of Antioch, as regent. Maria's Latin heritage made her unpopular with the mainly Greek population, and when she chose Manuel's nephew as her advisor and lover, this added to the resentment. Seeing his opportunity to finally seize power, in 1182, Andronikos gathered an army and marched on Constantinople, where he slaughtered the Catholic inhabitants of the city. Known as the Massacre of the Latins, tens of thousands of men, women and children were butchered. Andronikos had himself crowned co-emperor with Alexios in 1183 and forced the boy to sign his mother's death warrant. Charged with treason, Maria of Antioch was imprisoned and then strangled in her cell with a silken cord on Andronica's orders. Next, he turned his sights on Alexio's sister and arranged to have her and her husband poisoned. With only the boy now standing in his way, Andronikos had him deposed, strangled, and then beheaded. Be careful what you wish for. At the age of 63, Andronikos was finally the Byzantine Emperor, and he quickly married Alexios' 12-year-old widow, Agne of France. But his plan to get rid of the military aristocracy failed, and soon his popularity faded and there were many plots against him. Andronikos was himself deposed in a coup just two years into his reign. He tried to flee with his wife and mistress, but was captured and handed over to the mob. He was tied to a post, slapped, kicked, and had his right hand sliced off. His hair was pulled out, boiling water was thrown in his face, and one of his eyes was gouged out. Dung was shoved up his nose, and sponges soaked in urine squeezed into his remaining eye. After three days of torture, he was taken to the Hippodrome of Constantinople and suspended upside down, and his body torn apart. He died on the 12th of September, 1185. He was refused burial, and his remains were left on show for many years. Andronikos was described as a man of violence, cruelty, mutilation, and murder, and he ended his life the way he had lived it. He earned the nickname Hater of Sunlight because of the amount of enemies that he had blinded. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe if you're enjoying these videos, as we do release a new one every Friday. Hope you have a great week. Cheers!